Thank you, Dr. Shaviv. And as I mentioned at the outset, we'll take uh, questions uh, for the whole panel at the end of the three presentations. Our next speaker here on the uh, Climate History and Physics panel is uh, Dr. Howard Hayden. Uh, Dr. Hayden is Professor of Physics Emeritus at the University of Connecticut. He is also editor of the Energy Advocate, a monthly newsletter promoting energy and technology. It's a fantastic publication. I read it uh, every month. He is the author of, among other pub publications, The Solar Fraud, Why Solar Energy Won't Run the World, and A Primer on CO2 and Climate. Dr. Howard Hayden. Well, thanks to the Heartland Institute. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to give a talk to you here. Uh, mine will be a little bit uh, simple-minded. Um, well, that might be from becoming a professor emeritus. <laughs> emeritus means out of merit. <laughs> Oops. Um, <clears throat> over Phanerozoic time, uh, which is long, long periods. Uh, it's all the time life has been on Earth. That's the zoic part of it. CO2 and temperature are basically uncorrelated, but that does not mean that there's no relationship between CO2 and temperature because there are some basic physics that applied even uh, 200 million years ago. So we're going to consider for this talk only the last uh, century or so. Now, uh, this is a very rudimentary science lesson that uh, a ninth grade teacher would, maybe an eighth grade, I had a great eighth grade science teacher, would be talking to the class about. If you have quantitative causes and effects, now I'm distinguishing that kind of cause and effect from somebody sticks a gun in somebody's head and blows him away, that's a one-off event. Uh, quantitative things are when this quantity is related to that quantity. But in any case, if there is a cause and effect, uh, one identifies the cause, one identifies the effect, and makes a graph of the effect versus the cause. Now, if you were in the pharmaceutical business and you went to promote some kind of a drug to the FDA and you did not have a uh, chart, in fact, numerous charts that are called um, dose response curves, they would laugh you out of the hearing room. <clears throat> for, for climate change, which used to be called global warming, the cause is CO2 increase, the effect is the temperature rise. Now, what should we plot? Ah, plot the temperature rise versus the CO2 increase. So here's the very pedestrian view of that thing. The cause of uh, warming is increased CO2. The effect is temperature rise. Therefore, we make a plot that would look like that. And you're, right now, you're probably asking yourself why the IPCC has never made such a graph. I'm not going to defend them. <clears throat> um, people in this business, the skeptical business, have unfortunately uh, adopted the uh, IPCC paradigm, which is to plot time series of everything. That's a wonderful thing to do. It's very necessary, but it is insufficient because time is a parameter, not a cause. All right. So here's a, a chart that you could uh, have a, a student in elementary algebra do, namely, provide him with the table of uh, temperature anomaly have him find the temperature uh, rise since, say, 1880, which is what this graph is all about. Um, <clears throat> no, that's, no, actually, that's just, the, that's just the anomaly I plotted there. And have him plot the CO2 against the CO2 concentration, and you get it. It looks like that. And there's a, the red line there represents a, uh, a linear response, or, and uh, there's a little bit of a departure. You can sort of, sort of see the data bending over, but we have some science from the IPCC uh, that tells us that there should be logarithmic uh, uh, response anyway. And if there weren't, why would they be concerned with doubling of CO2? 
But logarithmic response, you're thinking half-lives and doubling times and so forth. Anyway, <clears throat> the temperature rise, according to the IPCC, should be proportional to the logarithm of the concentration now to the concentration at some starting point where we had a temperature T0 and a, and a concentration C0. And that would be a direct proportion, and so now we're going to do the obvious plot. But let me throw in a, um, a proviso here. This equation does not work for terribly low concentrations, say 20 ppm, uh, and it also doesn't work for high uh, Earth surface temperatures um, <clears throat> at current concentrations. Anyway, there's the graph. It's the same bunch of data, but in this case, what I have done is find the temperature rise since 1880 and plotted it on the vertical axis. I've taken the log of uh, the ratio of carbon dioxide at any given time uh, to the carbon dioxide concentration in 1880, and we get a nice straight line. And it has a coefficient of determination of 81%, which is very nice. That's the data from 130 years. Now, the first thing to notice <clears throat> is there is a slope. And if we say, well, what's the, uh, the, the effect of doubling? Ignore that little square. That's a funny thing that happened in, on the way to the computer. Um, 2.884 degrees C multiplied by the log of C over C0, where C over C0 is 2. That gives us a doubling uh, respond, uh, corresponding to a 2 degree temperature rise. That is, a two degree temperature rise is associated with CO2 doubling. Get over it. Not two and a half degrees, not three degrees, not three and a half degrees, and not 1.1 degrees, which is what you would get from black body considerations. <clears throat> it's two degrees. There's the graph again showing some uh, slopes like that would correspond to sensitivity of two and a half, three, three and a half degrees, so forth. You can see they're all wildly nuts. They do not fit. Second thing to notice is that the coefficient of determination is 81 uh, percent. The co correlation coefficient, which is what you apply in straight line cases, is 90 percent. That's really very high for climate da data. Apparently, I put this in yellow, apparently. CO2 controls temperature almost single-handedly, else how could you have such a high correlation coefficient? Meaning, please don't get too upset here. <laughs> Volcanoes, aerosols, land use changes, varying cloud cover, varying solar flux, ocean currents, deforestation, varying atmospheric H2O, blah, 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 they are mere sideshows. They only have a minuscule effect. And the sensitivity is two degrees with very little variation. But wait, there's more. This is figure 7.3 from the latest IPC, that should be IPCC, shouldn't it? Uh, AR4, um, that's the latest edition, figure 7.3. It is a chart showing the uh, reservoirs and the fluxes of carbon rather than carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide does not exist in plants. Anyway, uh, what you will notice is that we have uh, over at the right uh, 6.4 gigatons per year, some would say giga, comes to the same root as, root as giant. Uh, <clears throat> 6.4 gigatons per year of uh, carbon going into the air. And over near the left, you see land use changes uh, adding up, to, uh, amounting to 1.6. So that the upshot is that we are putting 8.0, at the time of this one uh, was written, uh, gigatons per year into the atmosphere. And, well, yeah, the, the red there is called anthropogenic in their... Um, uh, caption that came with this. Uh, 8, going into the atmosphere every year, 22.2 going into the ocean every year, that's anthropogenic. 20 
coming out of the ocean every year that's anthropogenic. Okay, the IPC says warming is anthropogenic. Warming oceans emit CO2. So increased CO2 ocean fluxes are anthropogenic and oh, that means later on we can use that to prove that climate change is anthropogenic. Uh, Henry's law is a relationship between the carbon dioxide or any gas above and within a liquid. And this pertains uh, water and, and CO2 concentration. And on a per unit, unit volume basis, the amount in the water and the amount in the atmosphere are about the same. But there's a lot more CO2 tied up in carbonates and bicarbonates. So we, we can use Boltzmann statistics to derive this equation that the temperature rise is directly proportional to the log of the CO2 ratio. Hmm, we've seen that kind of an equation before. Obviously, it is an exponential function. That's raw data. Um, <clears throat> a constant external CO2 pressure, what's the amount that's in the water, and so forth. So let's take a look at the oceans. Uh, here's a bunch of data from IPCC. And the data are pretty good from about 1910 on. They're in pretty good agreement. And arbitrarily, I chose the red line. Being lazy, I didn't uh, pick data out of the uh, green and blue lines. So now, <clears throat> on a year-by-year -year basis since 1910, uh, here is a plot of the temperature rise of the sea surface versus the log of the CO2 ratio. And what you'll notice is that at the left end, it's kind of noisy. There's a bunch of junk in there. Uh, at the right end, it's really pretty good, but the coefficient of determination is 86%, which is actually, actually very good. Uh, we have much, much better data, say, since uh, people started uh, reading CO2 at, uh, uh, in the mountaintop in Hawaii so forth. So here we have a plot of uh, sea surface temperature rise since 1962 versus the log of CO2 ratio. And we have a coefficient of determination of 98%, which is a 99% correlation coefficient. All right. Now why is the fit so good? It could be pure accident. Maybe there's something X that causes uh, both, that controls both those of, of CO2 and temperature. Another fit would, uh, another reason would be CO2 and virtually nothing else controls ocean temperature. And the other one would be that the temperature, especially the sea surface temperature and virtually nothing else controls atmospheric CO2 concentration. So there are many variables, uh, cloud cover, oceanic cycles, dust, aerosols, uh, everything we're going to hear about. Nir Shaviv gave, gave a nice talk about things that's just beginning, what we're going to hear. But whatever changes the surface temperature, the CO2 in the atmosphere responds. Okay, so the options are the CO2 controls uh, temperature almost by itself and climate sensitivity is two degrees, plus or minus very little. All matters like aerosols, cloud cover, you know, comic rays, <laughs> and so forth, are irrelevant sideshows. Ocean temperature is the other option, is ocean temperature is a primary controller of the atmospheric concentration. And the numerous things that we have uh, ac actually do affect ocean temperature. But atmospheric CO2 concentration simply responds to whatever the temperature is. So the worst case is CO2 controls temperature, and a two-degree temperature rise is associated with doubling, and there's nothing to get excited about. There's a, a graph from the uh, IPCC showing sensitivity um, uh, from various models, but the sensitivity is narrowed way down, and the rest is uh, JIGO results. Garbage in, garbage out, what went into their computers. We got 200 people in this room. We've, there's 100 watts, 20 kilowatts total. Did the temperature of the room rise since you came in here? What's that? That's a controller, okay? So the question is, does our combustion of fossil fuels increase atmospheric CO2? It is not entirely clear. Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with it because the oceans are actually controlling it. So the most likely case, in my view, is that to a large extent, increased CO2 concentration is a result of increased temperature. 
All those things affect temperature, but whatever the oceanic temperature, CO2 responds. My plea to ignorance is I couldn't think of anything else to explain the extremely high correlation between SST and atmospheric CO2 concentration. Perhaps you can. Perhaps the IPCC can, but not until they think about it. Okay, uh, what to do? In the worst case, nothing to get excited about. We got a two degree uh, temperature rise with doubling, no big deal. Most likely case, we have uh, our combustion products have very little to do with temperature, and to quote Pat Michaels, go find something useful to do. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you for listening.